Um, so at this particular school, I was speaking to a group of S2 pupils and um, just to generate some discussion with them at the, at the beginning of the session, uh, this was when I worked for a company called Tree of Knowledge who do kind of um, teamwork and motivational things in schools. I, I listened to a conversation that two of the pupils are having at the front row and uh, one, they were talking about the football or something like that and one of them said to the other, oh that was pure Barry. Um, now, if you don't, if you've never spent a lot of time on the east coast of Scotland, if something is Barry, I know now, that means it's good. Um, it's it's a good thing. If something is Barry, that means it's great. Um, if something is pure Barry, that means it's particularly good. Um, so, but I, I, of course, had never heard this before. And the other word that you might be aware of if you spent uh, time on the east coast of Scotland is the word Ken. And um, I had never heard either of these words being used uh, in, in, in this context. So in this situation, I heard the pupil saying to the other, oh, that was pure Barry. So I decided to ask the question, well, what's this word Barry? What do you mean by that? And the young man, uh, he, he asked me the most confusing question I've ever been asked in my life. He looked at me and he said, oh, mister, how do you know Ken Barry? Now, um, if you replay that question in your mind a few times and just consider it from my point of view, the question he was asking was, how is it you've gone through your entire life up until this moment and not heard the word Barry being used in that particular context? Uh, that was really what he was asking. How do you not know the word Barry? How do you know Ken Barry? Um, but of course, the question he asked was, how do you know Ken Barry? So I said, I, I'm sorry, I've never met him before. Um, so it was a complete communication breakdown. Um, the words we use uh, are very, very interesting, and character is one of those, I've heard it been described in the conference as a, as a kind of a slippery term, or intangible, or difficult to get your head around, and I think it's probably one of those concepts that demands uh, some thought, and I think that we've definitely... Uh, hopefully anyway uh, achieve that in the in the in the conference uh, today um, one of the key things I'd like to get across about Character Scotland is that um, we've made a point of organizing this conference in partnership with lots and lots of people. Um, so I personally spoke with all of the contributors. We had about 90 people all together yesterday uh, delivering workshops, which is a lot of people for, for a conference. Um, but we had personal contact with them and actually did things with them in the run-up to today. So it was very much a dialogue that we've engaged in with, with lots of people who are involved in this event. Uh, it's been really enjoyable and rewarding for me to to be involved in that. I've, I've taken a huge amount from that myself, which I'm, I'll, I'll share with you. Um, but uh, what I would like to do now is introduce two of those partners, those key people that we've, um, we, I've, been, I've been engaging with. Uh, one of whom is uh, Gillian Hunt. Uh, Gillian works for City of Edinburgh Council and she um, has been involved in, I suppose, two different aspects of this. Uh, she came with the Character Scotland team on a visit to the University of Birmingham, was that just a couple of weeks ago? A couple of weeks ago, um, to learn from the Jubilee Centre, and we had a great couple of days down there. And she's also been involved in the session with Grace Mount High School, so she's going to offer some reflections um, on those things. And uh, we're also joined by Julie Wilson, who um, it works for Keep Scotland Beautiful. Julie was on the is on the advisory committee for the conference, so she can tell you a bit about how that worked, and also she's got some reflections from attending the event herself as well. So uh, why don't we give a nice warm welcome to Gillian and Julie? It's a bit of an awesome room, isn't it? Um, I've never been inside this room before, it's fabulous. It doesn't really lend itself to a seminar, does it? I was going to get you all to come and sit in a wee semi-circle around here, but there's just too many of you. I thought I would start by giving you a little bit of reflection on who I am and where I'm from so that you can kind of get an idea of where I'm coming from with this. I was very sorry not to be able to join you yesterday for the conference. Um, 
Gary knows that I had to do a piece of work that I didn't want to do, so I had a real grumpy face on me all day yesterday instead of being here um, participating. I am Workforce Learning and Development Manager for the City of Edinburgh Council. I used to be a teacher and that was much, much easier. If people said to you, what do you do for a living? I'm a teacher. It was really easy. As a Workforce Learning and Development Manager, it's much harder to explain what I do. We have about 8,000 staff in the Children and Families Department in the City of Edinburgh Council and myself and my team look after their learning and development and all the kind of people stuff that goes with them. So that's what I do, but I was a teacher. Another thing that I've done recently, um, I gave up just last year, was I was a children's panel member. So for five years I served on the children's panel and most people in the room will know what that is. Um, perhaps one or two visitors that are maybe not from Scotland won't know about it. It's a place where we look after children. It's about looking after children, making sure they're safe, looking after children who are neglected and looking after children who perhaps get themselves into trouble although that's much, much fewer than those who are needing looked after for other reasons. So that's kind of what I do and where I'm coming from. As Gary said, we went to Birmingham to the Jubilee Centre just a few weeks ago um, and I was privileged to be an interloper with them, um, not one of Character Scotland but coming from a City of Edinburgh Council. What I wanted to do was to do a little bit of reflection on some of the things that you've been speaking about and that you are thinking about with this conference. And Gary gave me the sort of three questions where, why characters education, how do we do it, and so what. So I was kind of thinking about it from four perspectives and I was thinking about it from the individual's point of view, from the school's point of view, the local authority point of view and of course the national point of view. And when we were in Birmingham in the Jubilee Centre we were thinking about making changes and we were looking at fabulous resources and I encourage you if you haven't already looked at the resources at the Jubilee Centre to have a really good look at them. And we were just chatting before over coffee there about sometimes when teachers come to things they are looking for tips, they're looking for helpful suggestions. But that's not really what our professional learning is about. Our professional learning is about collaboration and about relationships and about changing our practice. And so it has to be about much more than that. And I think for me, the main question I asked when we were in Birmingham was, where do we start? Do we start from the one teacher in the one classroom with their young people in front of them? And as a primary school teacher, I think I found that quite easy. I was with the children for up to 25 hours a week. They had me. I had them, we could explore issues, we could look at moral issues as things came up. It's not so easy when you're in a secondary school. It's not so easy when you're only seeing children for a very small amount of time. So it got me thinking, should it be bottom up? Should it be top down? Um, we are trying to affect change in Scotland and we are a small country. But it surprises me how disconnected we are as a country with 32 different local authorities. And I'm go going to pose a question here. We are looking at improving attainment of our young people. And so we have in Scotland decided that we are going to appoint attainment advisors to do that. And I'm just going to throw that out there as a question to appoint 32 advisors to do that. It's going to cost us a lot of money to do that and I'm just not going to make any further comment on that, just say that's out there and that's the kinds of things that we're doing in Scotland. So, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the whole sort of caught and taught element of it. Um, and I wanted us to go back to 2003 and I don't know if you recall in 2003 we had something called the national debate. Does anybody remember that? One or, one or two nods. It was a really exciting time. It was a time when we were deciding to explore why we were educators. What had we come into this for? I certainly didn't come into this to raise attainment from a this to a that. I came in to work with children every day and change children's lives. That, that was what I came in to be a teacher for. And we had this wonderful national debate and from it came Curriculum for Excellence, which again is something that is hugely exciting. 
in some ways, I think that we may have lost our way a little bit with it. And Julie and I were at an event just a couple of weeks ago where Graham Donaldson, who was the author of Teaching Scotland's Future, was speaking about curriculum for excellence and Teaching Scotland's Future. And he had said that he had Googled curriculum for excellence. I don't know if you have. And he said the first stories that came up were about problems difficulties. How are we making this happen? And he said that we're really at the point of being in a perfect storm around that. Around talking it down and about it, the danger of losing the excitement that there was in the national debate. And I think we are at that perfect storm. I think we're at exactly the time when we should be talking about why are we educators? What are we in this job for? And I was really interested in, in what Marvin was talking about there and about the academic and character. And, and I, I love his prime acronym. Um, but I think that we need to own this debate now. And I think that we need to start having it again. Because I don't think we can do it with one teacher in one classroom. I think that we need to be having that debate across Scotland. Um, a couple of things that, that occurred to me as well were we have some projects going on um, around bystanders and when we were in Birmingham we were hearing the story of, now I don't know how to pronounce her name properly, but Kitty Genovese, have I pronounced that properly? Um, the young woman who in, um, in New York in 1964 was murdered and that her cries were heard by people who saw her being attacked and somebody shouted at her attacker and he ran away but nobody went to see what was happening and her attacker came back and murdered her. Now that was 50 years ago that that happened. There was outcry. There's all kinds of things on the internet about it if you want to go and have a look. There are some myths and legends around it but still it was a young woman who was killed because others didn't get involved and did not use the character traits that we would like our young people to have. I was watching Reporting Scotland last night and I saw something not nearly as, as devastating as, and, or as serious as that, but I watched people filming, um, filming uh, the robbery that took place in Glasgow. Did you see that last night on Reporting Scotland? Where the guys had gone in with axes and hammers and had broken into the, the jeweler shop and ran off with all these watches. And what surprised me the most about it was that people were standing watching and filming it happening. And I didn't see anybody even put their foot out and try and trip them up or anything. And I just think, how is that that we've had that 50 years ago, we have this now, and it's more important that people film it than participate and be part of the community that stops that kind of thing happening. So, um, I think really, if we're serious about this and if we're serious about character education, we need to start having that conversation. And it needs to be us who are having that conversation. We had a conference last year in Selmas, the Scottish Educational Leadership Management and Administration Society, and we had Leslie Ruddock who came to speak to us. And she said that the most inactive people were people like ourselves when we were talking nationally about what needs to happen in Scotland. That we are the people who are sitting in rooms like this having conversations, but not taking our conversations out further. So I think that's my inspiration for today is to think, well, who is it if it's not me who's going to go out and have those conversations? So that's where I'm going next, is to go out and have conversations with people and to see if we can restart having national debates around character education, around what the four capacities of Curriculum for Excellence are about and should be about for our children and young people. think I could um, stand here all day and listen to stories from folks. It's, one of, it's just such a lovely thing to be amongst a great community of folks who all have a story. But My name is Julie Wilson. I am Head of Education and Learning for an organisation called Keep Scotland Beautiful. Um, my own story about coming into education is because um, I was not very successful in it or at it and um, 
so my first kind of foray into thinking about training to be a teacher was actually out of a real sense of cussed mindedness about the fact that I didn't want any other children or young people to experience from education what I had experienced from education. So I started in education um, working with um, lots of young men who were in either residential care or on remand uh, in an area that at the time was called um, young people with social, emotional and behavioural difficulties. Um, which was me really and my story. But right from the beginning um, in education, one of the things that I have always tried to do is to try to walk alongside other educators because we have a saying in social emotional behavioural needs education that says, is it the child that challenges the system or the system that challenges the child? And many of our children and young people that really struggle in our formal system of education actually are only struggling, not because of themselves and what they bring to the party, but because of the system that is so fundamentally constraining and unkind that they suffer as they're in it and therefore don't flourish and do well in it. I've taught in three different systems of education uh, in England where I first trained to be a teacher. In Canada for a decade I was part of Department of Learning Services in Western Canada uh, and saw lots of things there especially with First Nations Canadians working on reservation land and in reservation schools and then um, in an urban context uh, in Edmonton and Saskatoon and then came to Scotland. and. Uh, have been here for quite a long time, revelling actually in the fact that we can even have a national conversation about education and the fact that we do listen and that does influence what our curriculum's like uh, and those kind of things and the fact that there is a possibility for things to change and to be transformed um, through our actions. So I'm really encouraged about that. I've been, um, as Gary says, on the advisory group um, that has met on several occasions to try to think about what this conference and event and community um, would be. And I have to say it's been one of my most delightful experiences because the way that character Scotland uh, goes about doing things is really to walk the talk. So that whole experience of being on an advisory group has been about listening and conversations and it's been entirely relational in its approach. And so if uh, this conference has kind of come out of anything, it's really um, the kind of child of that ongoing dialogue and listening and conversation, which has been um, a bit of a different experience from the way we sometimes do things uh, in education in Scotland. Uh, but that's been really good. The, the, um, the fact that Gary can reflect that there were 90 people here yesterday who uh, were helping to facilitate seminars and workshops and things like that, I think is a, a mark of the quality of that conversation and dialogue that Characters Scotland have actually engaged with, with folks as they've been going along on the journey and their approach has always been to be so inclusive in that. I think if we just look at the diversity of folks that were facilitating workshops and things yesterday, um, that's a testament, a great testament actually, uh, to Characters Scotland and its work. So I have um, just three, I hope, very short reflections on things that uh, have uh, been resonating with me about this process and about what character education um, means to me at this present time. Uh, in my work, I take forward across Scotland an agenda which is called Learning for Sustainability. And the, the, uh, immediately you use that word sustainability, people start thinking, oh right, she's the eco person, she does recycling and stuff. And um, for all, we need to also capture people's understanding of what pure Barry means. 
we also, I think, need to revisit what sustainability means and what character means kind of within that because essentially sustainability is the ability to sustain ourselves it has very little to do with recycling in the end although those are some behaviors and actions that contribute um, to us being able to keep ourselves well and safe and happy uh, into the future I work with thousands of children and young people and educators too across Scotland and one of the things that we've been exploring in our conversations with all of those folks is um, are there some aspects or dimensions of character that mean that you're, you're, you're effective in learning for sustainability, that you're good at that and one of those aspects has been the ability, um, we call it in social science field independence, but it's actually the ability to hold true to your values, despite the fact that the uh, situation you find yourself in pulls you in different directions and may be very fragmented and very... But we find that many of our young people are actually, through our present system of education, developing that ability to hold true. And Curriculum for Excellence, I think, has been one of the things that has spurred us much more to shape educational experiences around the individual needs and interests and aspirations of those young people. And I hope that that's been one of the effects of Curriculum for Excellence, is that we have many more young people now that do have a sense of autonomy and a sense of feeling empowered and engaged um, and that sense of self-efficacy that they can hold true to their essential values despite the stormy weather and despite peer pressure and despite some of the challenges and obstacles that they might face. I also think that we have lots of children and young people who are beginning to understand um, that they, their ideas and the person that they are can have influence on other people. So one of the aspects that we've been looking at is thought leadership and how many young people would think about themselves as uh, when they're talking about their ideas as being able to influence the ideas of their friends. We particularly looked at that with regard to uh, the more formal traditional aspects of sustainability and whether low carbon behaviours and those other things which we need to start to adopt that will take us into a more sustainable future um, are part of people's uh, way of being in situations. But the other thing that we've been really looking at is it's okay having some expectation that other people might change and it's okay having a little bit of the resource that you need to uh, be able to influence other folks in that change. But the spirit in which you do that is really important and so we've looked with children and young people at the whole idea, Marvin mentioned it earlier, of servant leaders, of how you walk alongside folks and really listen to them and move them along in a particular direction rather than the kind of top-down preachy waggy finger stuff that we often do about these messages about sustainability that we need to get across. So learning sustainability has been really important also in thinking about the formation of the educator in that. Do we have educators actually and are we raising educators in this country who have field independence? that they can actually hold true to their values despite the fact that somebody else three layers above them is telling them that you must do this, you must do this, you must do this. But fundamentally in their relationship with children and young people, are they able to live out those values and follow through on that way of being? And I've really been thinking about that as we've been listening the last couple of uh, uh, yesterday and then this morning. Another thing that I've been thinking about is changing practice. I started off um, in education uh, in Scotland working as National Development Officer for Outdoor Learning and Play and uh, that was all under the banner of Curriculum for Excellence and actually when Curriculum for Excellence came into being the doing of Curriculum for Excellence through outdoor learning was one of the first things that was introduced and why was it introduced really? Not just because we need to get our children and young people out there learning in real world, real life, real time contexts but actually because we were thinking about changing educator practice 
practice. And the easiest way to do that is to change the place where educators do that learning and teaching. And so I've made with thousands of teachers now that journey of taking the learning and the teaching into an outdoor context, which has fundamentally asked them to learn and to teach and to go about that whole process in a different way. One of the other reasons why we had outdoor learning in Curriculum for Excellence is because of inclusion and social justice. That actually a different place where learning and teaching happens demands a different approach and a much more relational, values-based approach to things. And often for many children and young people that gives them access to their learning through those different experiences in ways that in the traditional formal four walls of the classroom they wouldn't be able to access that. So I've been thinking about character education a little bit in that context, that actually ways of being are sometimes very much um, uh, dictated by the place where that's happening. And actually getting outside of those formal four walls of the classroom might be really, really important in this process of thinking about ways to be that lead to the formation of characterful traits in our children and young people. And then the last thing I think is about supporting our schools. It's very interesting to me that there aren't lots of head teachers here. We've just had a big thing now. We have a new qualification for our head teachers. We have a new program. We have a whole new thing. But some of the conversations that I've been having with people, and uh, teacher education and professional learning is um, a big passion of mine, but it's also uh, the other half of the way that I spend my time in Scotland at the moment. And one of the things that we have been really thinking about, or that have been provoked in me to be thinking and talking about over the last day or so, is who's supporting our head teachers with this stuff. We've lost in our public services now so many of the people who do or used to come alongside our head teachers and wrestle through these kind of whole school, whole school community issues with them, who walked the talk alongside our head teachers and modelled for them ways of being in terms of leadership. I'm really struck with some of the things that Marvin's saying about ways of being for school leaders and how essential and important that is. And the formation of really effective educators does have some dependence on the style and the approach to leadership in a school context that's taken. But who's looking after those folks? And is it just enough to say that they can look after each other? Or do we need more help than that? Or more support? We founded Curriculum for Excellence in Scotland on the four values which are engraved on the mace of Scotland, on wisdom, justice, compassion and integrity. And supporting our school leaders and our educators in the formation of those values as they're expressed in their characterful ways of being as they're going about their normal daily work, I think is probably one of the most important tasks that I'm now provoked by this conference into trying to take forward in Scotland.